Hello again, we are back. My name is Dana McKellar Intaka, woman of science, woman of God. We are continuing on with key concepts of clinical trials, a narrative review by Dr. Craig Umscheid et al. The scientists and clinicians are from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The next subject, the next title rather, in this article is Overview of Trial Design. We're getting right into the body of a study. Clinical trials in their purest form are designed to observe outcome of human subjects under experimental conditions controlled by the scientist. This is contrasted to non-interventional study designs, i.e. cohort and case control studies, in which the investigator measures but does not influence the exposure of interest. A clinical trial design is often favored because it permits randomization of the intervention, thereby effectively removing the selection bias that results from the imbalance of unknown or immeasurable confounders. Within this inherent strength is the capacity to unveil causality in an RCT. Randomized clinical trials, however, still remain subject to limitations such as misclassification or information bias of the outcome or exposure. Co-interventions where one arm receives an additional intervention more frequently than another. And contamination where a proportion of subjects assigned to the control arm receive the intervention outside of the study. Execution of a robust clinical trial requires the selection of an appropriate study population. Despite all participants voluntarily consenting for the intervention, the enrolled cohort may potentially differ from the general population from which they were drawn. This type of selection bias, called volunteer bias, may arise, may arise from such factors as study eligibility, criteria, inherent subject attributes, e.g. geographic distance from the study site, health status, attitudes and beliefs, education and socioeconomic status, or subjective exclusion by the investigator because of poor anticipated enrollee compliance or overall prognosis. Although RCTs seek to achieve internal validity by enrolling a relatively homogeneous population according to predefined characteristics, narrow inclusion and exclusion criteria may limit their external validity or generalizability to a broader population of patients with highly prevalent comorbidities that may not be included in the sample cohort. This theme underscores why an experimental treatment's efficacy, i.e. measure of the success of an intervention in an artificial setting may not translate into its effectiveness, i.e. measure of its value in the real world. Attempts to improve patient recruitment and generalizability using free medical care financial payments and improved communication techniques are considered ethical as long as the incentives are not duly coercive. Now there's a line here that I'd like for us to review. Okay, this theme underscores why an experimental treatment efficacy, which is defined as a measure of the success of an intervention in an artificial setting, may not translate into its effectiveness, i.e. a measure of its value applied in the real world. In the real world. That makes me think about the COVID-19 vaccinations where we were still encouraged to do physical distancing. We were still encouraged to wear our mask because there is a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. That's how a treatment or a therapy or a device reacts in the real world. Remember these terms. 
in conducting research, there's so many terminologies that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds. And people complain about having to still wear a mask and still observe physical distance once they were vaccinated. That is because there's a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Moving on. In order to access the efficacy of an intervention within the context of a clinical trial, there must be deliberate control of all known confounding variables, including comorbidities, thereby requiring a homogeneous group of participants. However, the evidence provided by a well-designed and executed clinical trial will have no value if it cannot be applied to the general population. So that simply means that if you're going to do a study with diabetes, you want to, as much as possible, make sure that those participants have just diabetes and not heart uh, issues, no cardiac issues, no stroke issues, because that will confound the study and the results will not be clear. You won't know if the results are based upon the diabetes alone or any other comorbidities, any other diseases or conditions that may affect outcome. Thus, the designers of clinical trials must use subjective judgment, including clinical, epidemiological, biostatistical reasoning to determine at the outset how much trade-off they are willing to make between the internal validity and the generalizability of a clinical trial. A surrogate endpoint is often chosen in place of a primary endpoint to enhance study efficiency, i.e. lost cost and time, improved measurability, and smaller sample size requirement. Ideally, the surrogate should completely capture the effect of intervention on the clinical endpoint as formally proposed by Prentice. Blood pressure is a well-established surrogate for cardiovascular related mortality because its normalization has been associated with clinically beneficial outcomes such as fewer strokes and less renal and cardiac complications. However, one must use caution when relying on surrogates as they may be erroneously implicated in the direct causal pathway between intervention and true outcome. A frequently described clinically logical but flawed use of a surrogate endpoint was premature ventricular contractions or PVCs to access whether antirhythmic drugs reduce the incidence of sudden death after a myocardial infarction in the cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, which is abbreviated CAST. Despite evidence of the association between PVCs premature ventricular contractions, and early arrhythmic mortality, pharmacologic suppression of PVCs unexpectedly increased and unexpectedly increased the very event mortality that it was supposed to remedy. Let me read that again. Despite evidence of the association between PVCs and early arrhythmic mortality, pharmacologic suppression of PVCs unexpectedly increased the very event mortality that it was supposed to remedy. Simply stated, sometimes things go wrong in trials. As surrogates are commonly employed in phase one and phase two trials, it is highly likely that a high proportion of clinically effective therapeutics are discarded because of the false negative results using such endpoints. This is exemplified in the trial by the International Chronic Granulomatous Disease, GCD, pardon me, CGD study group, in which the surrogate markers of superoxide production and bactericidal efficiency were initially applied to assess the efficiency of interferon, interferon, interferon gamma for the treatment of GCD. For reasons outside the scope of this review, I need to mark something here. 
For reasons outside the scope of this review, the authors decided a priori to extend the study duration in order to adequately detect the clinical endpoint of interest, recurrent serious infections instead of the originally proposed surrogate markers, superoxide production, and bactericidal efficiency. Treatment with interferon was incredibly successful as the rate of recurrent serious infections was highly reduced. However, there was no observ observable effect on superoxide production and bactericidal activity. Had the priority endpoint not been changed, the originally proposed surrogate biomarkers would have masked the clinically re relevant efficiency of this treatment. These examples illustrate the importance of validating surrogates as reliable predictors of clinical endpoints using meta-analysis and or natural history studies of large population cohorts in conjunction with ensuring biological plausibility. Now, before going on to read that last paragraph in this section, I'm just gonna show you here where I made some marks. This, again, is another reason that I enjoy printing things up, and I do front and back so that I am being true to being a conservationist and an environmentalist, but I marked the interferon uh, for treatment of CGD because I have memorized the capital letters for the Greek alphabet, but many of the lowercase letters that we use in medical science are different from the capital. So I just wanna go and do a quick search and make sure that I am assigning the right lowercase letter to the name of that interferon treatment. So don't be afraid to write in your margins. Don't be afraid to take a break, stop and look up a term that you are not uh, familiar with. Normally I would have an iPad or a laptop next to me and could do that right here, but we'll come back to that. Just leaving myself a reminder. For a trial to adequately address the primary questions of interest, a sufficient sample size is required to have enough power to detect potential statistical difference. Traditionally, power is defined as having at least an 80% chance of finding a statistically significant difference between the outcomes of two interventions when a clinically meaningful difference exists. The outcomes or endpoints of the investigation, whether objective, e.g. death, or subjective, e.g. quality of life, must always be reliable and meaningful measures Statistical analysis commonly used to analyze outcomes include logistic regression for dichotomous endpoints, e.g. the event occurred or the event did not occur. Poisson progression for rates, e.g. the number of events per person or years. Cox regression for time events, e.g. survival analysis and linear regression for continuous measures, e.g. weight. Now, these are statistical terms that we use, mathematical terms. Most scientists should know how to perform a Cox regression or a, a Poisson regression. If you're a little bit rusty on that, there will be some later videos that we'll go back and we'll discuss those. But always consult your professional biostatistician, statistician, and they would certainly have a great command of those numbers. Uh, one of the worst things that can happen is for you to submit work and then the numbers are not mathematically correct. During the peer review process, our peers, our superiors are going to be taking a, a serious look at your work. And today, the consumer, the subject is extremely well trained. They are extremely well read. You have some lay people who will come and look at your numbers and say, no, these numbers are not correct. So it takes that multidisciplinary team to make sure that our final product, our publication is without flaws. And they are works in progress. Publish or perish, it's what we say in medical science. The next section is entitled Overview of Drug Development. Now we get down to the fun part. The general road to drug development and approval has been defined and regulated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, for decades. 
Safety has historically been its primary focus, followed by efficacy. If a drug appears promising in preclinical studies, a drug sponsor or sponsor investigator can submit an IND or an investigational new drug application. This detailed proposal contains investigator qualifications and all preclinical drug information and data and a request for exemption from the federal statutes that prohibit interstate transport of unapproved drugs. After approval, the drug is studied in phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, which are described in this article and we'll get into that. And if demonstrated safe and efficacious in the intended population, the drug sponsor can then submit a new drug application or NDA to the FDA. After an extensive review by the FDA that often involves a recommendation by an external committee, the FDA determines whether the therapeutic can be granted an indication and marketed. After final approval, the drug can continue to be studied in phase four trials in which safety and effectiveness in the indicated population is monitored. So that simply means that even after a drug has been approved, that phase four trial is when the drugs are out in the world, they're being utilized by patients and they are still being studied. To facilitate evaluation and endorsement of foreign drug data, efforts have been made to harmonize this approval process across the United States, Europe, and Japan through the International Conference on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, simply abbreviated ICH, International Conference on Harmonization. Preclinical Phase One and Phase Two Trial. Preclinical investigations include animal studies and evaluations of drug production and purity I got my start in animal investigations probably at the age of 18, uh, working alongside one of my professors in a laboratory. My next encounter with animals, then I worked with humans quite a bit, and then my next encounter with animals was in my early 20s in a lab working with mice and rats, and we were studying uh, tumors we harvested the cancerous cells in the lab by cutting a tumor out of a mouse that already had cancer. Before that mouse was euthanized, we would take those cells and by harvesting them, we mean grinding them in an industrial-based blender, adding a solution, placing those into vials and to be stored in a freezer. Once they were thawed, then we would draw them up in a syringe or a pipette spread them out on a petri dish, harvest them, place them in the incubator, have them to grow, then inject them into a new generation of mice. And that procedure was completed over and over and over. In animal research, there are certain protocols that we must follow so that we are treating these animals as humane as possible. And we know that there are organizations like PETA, P-E-T-A, that that organization is an advocate for animals so we work closely with those organizations so that we can come to an agreement before drugs are tried on humans they are usually tested on animals i know that you have some companies that are natural and they their claim to fame they boast that they do not do animal treatment first but i did uh, get a very early start with animal treatment and have worked with rats with mice with lambs to make those correlations between what happens in the animal model and the human model. A treatment must be successful in the animal model first before we go on to humans. So animal studies explore, number one, the drug safety in dosed equivalent to the approximated human exposure. Again, the drug safety in doses that are equivalent to the approximate human exposure. Number two, pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics is defined as mechanisms of action and the relationship between the drug's level and clinical response. Number three, pharmacokinetics. 
that is drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and potential drug-to-drug -drug interactions. This data must be submitted for IND approval if the drug is to be further studied in human subjects. Because the FDI, the FDA rather, emphasizes safety first, it is logical that the first of four stages, known as phases of a clinical trial, is designed to test the safety and maximum dose tolerance, MTD, of a drug. Human pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and drug-to-drug -drug interactions. These phase one trials, synonymous with dose escalation or human pharmacology studies are the first instance in which new investigational agent is studied in humans and are usually performed open label and in a small number of healthy and or diseased volunteers. The MTD or the drug dose before a dose limiting toxicity can be determined using various statistical designs. Dose escalation is based on very strict criteria and subjects are closely followed for evidence of drug toxicity over a sufficient period. There is a risk that subjects who volunteer or the actual physicians who enroll the patients for phase one studies will misinterpret its objective as therapeutic. For example, strong evidence that objective response rates in phase one trials of chemotherapeutic drugs is exceedingly low, as low as 2.5%. And there is a footnote there. Patients may still have a therapeutic misconception of potentially receiving a direct medical benefit from trial participation. Improvements to the process of informed consent could help dispel some of the misconceptions while still maintaining adequate control numbers. Now, I might add that as articles are being written, whether it is for an academic course or whether it is to send out to industry or out to the public, there are footnotes and references all throughout. Generally, it is considered plagiarism if you are not giving a reference every two to three lines. When we discover information, we formulate a set of numbers, we will, without the reference, that signifies that the people who are writing the article produced the work. Otherwise, you should expect to see a name and a date in text as well as the full citation in the reference section. Moving on, phase two trials, also referred to as therapeutic explanatory trials are usually longer than phase one studies and are conducted in a small number of volunteers who have the disease of interest. They are designed to test safety, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics, but may also be designed to answer questions essential to the planning of phase three trials, including determination of optimal doses, dose frequencies, administration routes, and endpoints. In addition, they may offer preliminary evidence of drug efficacy by, number one, comparing the drug study with historical controls from published case series or trials that establish the efficiency of standard therapies, two, examining different dosing arms within the trial, or three, randomizing subjects to different arms, such as a control arm. However, the small number of participants and primary safety concerns within a phase two trial usually limit its power to establish efficacy and thereby supports the necessity of a subsequent phase three trial. At the conclusion of the initial trial phases, a meeting between the sponsors, investigators, and FDA may occur to review the preliminary data, IND, and ascertain the viability of 
progressing further to a phase three trial, including plans for trial design, size, outcomes, safety concerns, analyses, data collection, and case report forms. Manufacturing concerns may also be discussed at this time. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes with getting a new biologic, therapeutic, or treatment out to market. Several meetings are happening behind the scenes. Everyone's credentials are being verified. Any continuing medical education courses that you have to take, they have expiration dates. So updates on courses have to be in file because these audits are done all throughout the process. If an audit is done, everything needs to be in place. Phase three trial, that's the next section. Based on prior studies demonstrating drug safety and potential efficacy, a phase three trial, also referred to as therapeutic confirmatory, comparative efficacy, or a pivotal trial may be pursued. This stage of drug assessment is conducted in a larger and more diverse target population in order to demonstrate and or confirm efficacy and to identify and estimate the incidence of common adverse reactions. Remember that, phase three trials. However, given that phase three trials are usually no larger than 300 to 3,000 subjects, they consequently have the statistical power to establish an adverse rate of no less than one in 100 persons. And this is based on Hanley's rule of three. I have a special video on Hanley's rule of three that we'll upload. This highlights the significant phase, the significance of phase four trial in identifying less common adverse drug reactions and is one reason why the FDA usually requires more than one phase three trial to establish drug safety and efficacy. Now for the people who were a bit concerned about the speed at which the COVID-19 vaccines were brought to market, phase three trials are often repeated as the article stated so that less common adverse reactions can be detected. So while it may seem that some of these processes happen very quickly, labs are working around the clock. I am a night person and I love that overnight shift. I've been a night person all my life since I was a toddler. So while many people are sleeping, the work is going on in these labs. The most common type of phase three trials, comparative efficacy trials, often referred to as superiority or placebo-controlled trials. Compare the intervention of interest with either a standard therapy or a placebo. So in other words, it's tested against something that's already out in industry or a placebo, which is like a water pill or something that has no scientific value. Even in the best designed placebo controlled studies, it is not uncommon to demonstrate a placebo effect in which subjects exposed to the inert substance exhibit an unexpected improvement in outcomes when compared with historical controls. I love that placebo effect. Just the thought of doing something can make you feel better. While some attribute the placebo effect to a general improvement in care imparted to subjects in a trial, others argue that those who volunteer for a study are acutely symptomatic and will naturally improve or regress to the mean as the trial progresses. This further highlights the uniqueness of study participants and why a trial may lack external validity. The application of placebos, including surgical procedures, I'm sorry, surgical placebos, sham procedures, has ignited some debate. The revised declaration of Helsinki supports comparative efficacy trials by discouraging the use of drug placebos in favor of the best current treatment controls. Another type of phase three trial is the equivalency trial, 
or a positive control study. This is designed to ascertain whether the experimental treatment is similar to the chosen comparator within some margin pre-specified by the investigator. Hence, a placebo is almost never included in this study design, as long as the differences between the intervention and the comparator remain within this pre-specified margin, the intervention will be deemed equivalent to the comparator. Although the pre-specified margin is often based on external evidence, statistical foundations, and clinical experience, there remains little guidance for setting acceptable margin. A variant of the equivalency trial, the non-inferiority study, is conducted with the goal of excluding the possibility that the experimental intervention is less when interpreting the results of all types of equivalency trials because they are often incorrectly designed and analyzed as if they were comparative efficacy studies. Such flaws can result in a bias towards the null, which would translate into a false negative result in a comparative efficacy study, but a false positive result in an equivalency trial. Of note, the non-inferiority trial is more susceptible to false positive results than other study designs. A hallmark of the phase three trial design is the balance in treatment allocation for comparison of treatment efficacy. Implemented through randomization, this modern clinical trial practice attempts to eliminate imbalance of confounders and or any of the systematic differences or biases between treatment groups. The statistical tool of randomization first introduced into clinical trials by Sir Austin Bradford Hill was born out of the necessity and ethical justification of rationing limited supplies of streptomycin in a British trial of pulmonary tuberculosis. I cannot say enough about how much history plays a vital role in science. The most basic randomization model, simple randomization, randomly allocates each subject in a trial arm regardless of those already designed, i.e. a coin flip for each subject. Although easy to perform, major imbalances in treatment assignments or distribution of covariance can ensue, making this strategy less than ideal. To improve on this method, a constraint can be placed on randomization that forces the number of subjects randomly assigned per arm to be equal and balanced after a specified block size or block randomization. For example, in a trial with two arms, a block size of four subjects would be designated as two positions in arm A and two positions in arm B. Even though the positions would be randomly assigned within the block of four subjects, it would be guaranteed that after randomization of four subjects, two would be in arm A and two subjects would be in arm B, and that is outlined in table one. The main drawback of applying a fixed block allocation is that small block sizes can allow investigators to predict the treatment of the next patient, resulting in unblinding. For example, if a trial has a block size of two and the first subject in the block was randomized to treatment A, then the investigator would know that the next subject will be randomized to the other treatment. Variable block sizes can help prevent this unblinding, e.g. a block size of four followed by a block size of eight followed by a block size of six. Another feature of phase three trial design is stratification, which is commonly employed in combination with randomization to further balance study arms on pre-specified characteristics rather than size in case of blocking. Stratification facilitates analysis by ensuring that specific prognostic factors of presumed clinical importance 
are properly balanced in the arms of the clinical trial. Stratification of a relatively small sample size that has also undergone block randomization may result in loss of the originally intended balance, thereby supporting the merits of alternative techniques such as minimization or dynamic allocation designed to reduce imbalances among multiple strata and study arms. Often the phase three trial design dictates that the interventions be blinded or masked. In an effort to minimize assessment bias of subjective outcomes, specific blinding strategies to curtail this information bias include single binding, subject only, double blinding, both subject and investigator, or triple blinding, data analyst, subject and investigator. Unfortunately, not all trials can be blinded, e.g. method of drug delivery cannot be blinded, and the development of established drug toxicities may lead to inadvertent unmasking and raise ethical and safety issues. When appropriate, additional strategies can be applied to enhance study efficiency, such as assigning each subject to serve his or her own control crossover study or evaluating more than one treatment simultaneously, which is considered factorial design. The most common approach to analyzing phase three trials is the intention to treat analysis in which subjects are assessed based on the intervention arm to which they were randomized, regardless of what treatment they actually received. This is commonly known as the analyze as randomized rule. A complementary or secondary analysis is an as treated or per protocol analysis in which subjects are evaluated based on the treatment they actually received regardless of whether they were randomized to that treatment arm. Intention to treat analyses are preferable for the primary analysis of RCT as they eliminate selection bias by preserving randomization. Any difference in outcomes can therefore be attributed to the treatment alone and not confounders. This is a sort of like a process of elimination. In contrast, as treated or per protocol approach may eliminate any benefit of random treatment selection in an interventional trial as it estimates the effect of treatment perceived, received. The study thereby becomes similar to an interventional cohort study with the potential for treatment selection bias. If adherence in the treatment arm is poor and contamination in the control group is high, an intention to treat analysis may fail to show a difference in outcomes. This is in contrast to a per protocol analysis that takes into account these protocol violations. Based on the vast combination of strategies applicable to the design of a phase three study, the consolidated standards of reporting trials, which is abbreviated as CONSORT guideline was established to improve the quality of trial reporting and assist with evaluating the conduct and validity of trials and their results. Employing a flow diagram, which is in figure one, and a 22 item checklist located in table two, readers can easily identify stages in which subjects withdraw from a study, e.g. found to be ineligible, lost to follow up, cannot be evaluated for the primary endpoint. Because exclusion of such missing data can reduce study power and lead to bias, the best way to avoid these challenges is to adhere to the consort checklist, thereby enrolling only eligible patients and ensuring that they remain on study. We have now completed a detailed explanation of a phase one trial 
a phase two trial and a phase three trial. I would encourage you to watch this video again as many times as you need to. We will take a break here and we'll come back to get into part three, which will be phase four trials, clinical trials, oversight, and just the follow-up and the summary of that article. This journal article can be found at the National Institutes of Health Public Access site. It is entitled, Key Concepts of Clinical Trials, a Narrative Review by Dr. Craig A. Umscheid, Dr. David J. Margolis, and Dr. Craig E. Grossman, all from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My name is Dana McKellar-Intaka, woman of science, woman of God. Thank you again for tuning in.